everybody. Kamusta po sa inyo lahat? Bienvenidos. My name is Giovanni Ortega. I am uh, moderating this conversation for East West Players. I'm also the artistic director for Film Arts Teatro. So we have a show that's upcoming, a world premiere called On This Side of the World, a musical um, by Paolo K. Pirol, created with and directed by Noam Shapiro. So let's bring Paolo and Noam. Hey, you two. How's it going? Hey, Gio. Hi. It's going well. How are you? I'm Como good. Sta? Mabute. Mabute. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm just, I'm so excited. I, I just uh, am uh, so excited to be supporting. We are so excited to be supporting your musical. Both of you have been so gracious in the last um, uh, few years. Uh, I remember, you know, bringing it and we having excerpts for for Phil M. Arts Teatro September 25th of 2021. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and it was such an honor to meet meet you both and get to know you. And now we're here now from we're here. at East West Players. Mm -hmm. uh, you just had your preview. So how, how's it been? How's it been for both of you in this process? Oh my gosh. Uh, it's been a whirlwind. Um, it's been very exciting. Uh, we arrived in LA five weeks ago, five weeks ago and began wow. rehearsals with our six person cast, with our uh, creative team, with our rehearsal team. Um, but even before that, Noam had been talking to, for months, you've been talking to the design team. Um, and we've also, over the past five weeks, apart from teaching all the music, we've been making like adjustments. I mean, it's, it's the process with new work, with any new work, any new play, any new musical. And there are just so many moving parts, uh, but we're just so lucky to have such a great creative team and such a such a great cast who's yeah. just so good. Mm. And what's what's so exciting for me is Paolo's been working on this show for ten years. I've been collaborating with Paolo for five years, and to finally get to see it fully designed with full costumes and sets and projections and like so many different lights uh, with an amazing cast of six actors. That is the most exciting thing for me because we can listen to the music and Paolo can play the songs, but to actually have actors interpret them and to have this amazing LA audience experience the show, that that was incredible. Last night, one of the actors after our first preview said like she'd never felt that kind of energy mm. at a theater before. Uh, and and you can't, you can't anticipate that. You just have to experience it. Yep. And to what you said, Gio, like uh, we met two years ago, uh, 2021, um, our first uh, our first visit of the show's first visit uh, mm -hmm. to the to the West Coast. And I had honestly been like pretty scared back then because I'm like, how is L.A. going to receive uh, a musical written by two guys out of New York uh, who, who, <laughs> who, who are who are, un, who are unknown, who are unknown? Um, uh it had been a dream for us to come to LA uh, because LA is like uh, the largest Filipino population uh, in the US and the culture, Pinoy culture here in LA is just so like interwoven with the fabric of the broader community. There's, you can't really tell like where does Filipino American culture end and where does non-Filipino American culture begin because it's just so meshed together so well. Um, and we'd been wanting to come and then with East West players, uh, being the largest and longest running Asian American theater in the country and Philam Arts being uh, such a bastion of um, Pinoy culture in the SoCal area. Uh, so it was very exciting that we had that opportunity. There was the nervousness of like, how are we going to be received? Mm. But it's been nothing but warmth and support. I remember when we did our uh, historic Filipino town event uh, and we had a packed house, we did like 10 songs. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the reception was just unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so we're so happy that now we're being able to premiere this work in full at East West Players and that Philam Arts continues to support the work. Um, it's just been such a joy and an honor. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important to note also that um, the beauty of the piece is it's very specific culturally, right? Um, uh, so it's it's this whole notion of um, you, you developing uh, a voice for marginalized narratives 
Mm-hmm. But at the same time, and uh, no, I, I want you to share the the shared experience, right? So it's it's for Filipinos, written by a Filipino, but the fact that it is interwoven with narratives that intersect globally is so beautiful. And I, I want you to actually both discuss this this friendship that's <laughs> that's come come you know to frui- fruition through this through this project. Yeah. Um, no, I love that you said, I, I love that you talked about the marginalized voices um, uh, and, and how it like speaks to the broader audience. I started writing this piece 10 years, oh my gosh, 10 years ago. Uh, I write it, started writing it while I was in grad school at NYU. Uh, for one class, the brief was choose a community about which you're going to write a set of songs for the next two years. Mm. And I chose Pinoy immigrants in the U.S. because I was one. Um, I mean, I am one. I am a Pinoy immigrant in the U.S. Uh, I had a lot of friends whose stories I could borrow and turn into songs. And I didn't know of any other Pinoy immigrant composer lyricists who were writing specifically about the Pinoy immigrant uh, um, experience. Uh, So for the first five years, um, I wrote maybe eight songs. Uh, but then I always kept thinking, no one is going to want to work with me on this, let alone mm. let alone buy a ticket to want to see this show. Uh, but everything changed when Noam just happened to hear something. And yeah, sure, I I, I love the way you tell this story. So just tell it. Oh, it, it <laughs> no, because this 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 will totally speak to like how the specificity of this experience just yeah. is able to. Yeah. Go ahead. I stopped talking. So, so it was in uh, the spring of 2018. Yes, and it was a rainy, like muggy day in New York City, and and there was a concert at Joe's Public, the Public Theater, and I was living way uptown uh, in Manhattan, and and I had tickets to go to this concert of new musical theater writers, particularly um, writers of color, POC writers, uh, and LGBTQIA mm-hmm. writers, and I I just. I love new work. I love exciting new voices that haven't been heard before. And so I wanted to attend to support a friend, Uh, but because it was rainy and because it was so gross out, I really didn't plan to go. I was like, I'm not gonna go. This is just a waste of my time. Uh, It's it's so gross, I'll stay at home. And in the last minute I decided to go. And I'm Mm -hmm. so glad that I did because I, I had the amazing experience of hearing Paolo's music for the first time. There were a lot of amazing and talented composers there, but Paolo shared one song, Ilao Nang Tahanan, Light of the Home, mm. uh, which is about three OFWs, overseas foreign workers uh, who are a home healthcare aides. And uh, I wrote in my program, I've got chills next to the song because I had never seen these songs, uh, these stories on stage before. I'd never seen these characters in a musical. And I I thought this is astonishing and more people should see and experience these stories. And I'm not Filipino, but my mom is an immigrant from Israel. uh, And many of the characters reflections about being apart from home, feeling like they are removed from their families, from the roles and the lives that they thought they were going to have, um, deeply resonated with me, resonated with my mom's experience coming to the United States with a one-way ticket and not planning to stay, but ultimately deciding to stay. Uh, and I I wrote Paolo a cold email because I said, I need to meet this <laughs> amazing writer. And I, and I very explicitly said, I'd love to hear more of your songs because at the time I actually thought that that song was part of a a single musical about OFWs, like those trio of women. And I was delighted to learn that there were so many other characters and stories that Paolo Mm. was exploring. And what I think that we've seen with audiences Mm. is whether you're Filipino, um, whether you're Phil Am or you're an immigrant yourself. An immigrant with another background. Yeah, with another Mm -hmm. background. or even people who are farther removed from the immigrant experience, like whose families have been in the U.S. for generations. Mm they always do find something um, in the show that and, resonates with them. And it's because it's so specific, it can then be so universal. Like it's really specific about the OFW experience, but it's also dealing with you know, themes of, of loneliness, of separation, of mm-hmm. searching for purpose, longing, longing. identity. Um, one of my good friends uh, who is not Filipino either, um, he just told me early, early on that he was listening to one of the songs about three fathers, uh, longing 
for their families and thinking about how they're missing all these milestones in their lives and just crying on the subway listening to that song. But I, but the, the show is also so so funny and so accessible. So it's not just the kind of um, more traditional immigrant narratives of hardship and struggle. There are also like very privileged characters who are dealing with the changed circumstances of living in the United States, mm -hmm. like a really bratty girl who came from tremendous wealth and like doesn't know what to do now that she's without her <laughs> yaya. Um, <laughs> or or more like Donya, like titas. Tita who, types. Yeah, who are with their Louis Vuitton bags. Yeah. Uh, and the the chismos. Uh, the chismosas, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so it, it really does capture like the whole spectrum of experiences, uh, which is awesome. It's it's really been a pleasure to take characters, moments that I had experienced as an immigrant myself or seen in my immigrant friends' lives. Take a single line, for example. Um, one song sprang out of a fourteen-year-old girl's utterance at the, at a church that I work at. Uh, she's a, she's a first generation Phil M. She's fourteen, and she just exclaimed out of the blue, "My mother is an immigrant!" And I took that line and just like excavated. So what 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 does that mean? Uh, what does that mean for how she thinks, how she views the world, for her experience, and just to be able to show fully fleshed out characters on stage who come from my community mm. uh, are not just like cookie cutter representations of like this community has just been like a huge honor. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it it's great. I mean just the the beauty of the different songs and what's really great about your piece is that we're not a monolith. We're not a homogenous group, right? Not so you all. show the different um colors of our identities, which is really important uh especially right now. Mm -hmm. And um and June is, um, you know, celebration for Philippine Independence Day, but also LGBTQIA mm -hmm. plus month. Um, yes. I mean, rice queen, right? <laughs> but, but also just, just for someone who identifies as queer and mm -hmm. as Filipino, you know, that I think it's beautiful and important to convey our, our stories um, also. Yeah. Um... Yeah, as a queer writer, the first song I wrote in the show was Rice Queens. Oh, it was, was it really? <laughs> it was the very, very first song. And For yeah, I was in Hell's Kitchen. About... <laughs> the song, so the song is about this guy who's fresh off the boat and he's the, the the intro the line the song begins when I first came to America, I thought I'd have trouble with dating. Who'd want a guy so smooth and brown, so short and so provincial town? Short and smooth. <laughs> um, who barely has his idioms down, not to mention a, a zero credit rating, but then he realizes that he actually has a niche market uh, <laughs> on, on, the dating, on the dating scene, whatever app he goes on. Um, there is a niche. There is a niche for people who are Asian. Um, yeah, and it's just, the song was written originally as just this like fun little cabaret number celebrating that. It's like, oh, I'm so excited. There are people who, who go for me just because I'm Asian. But I guess the interesting thing is in, in more recent years, uh, because it was the very first song that was written from the show, um, we, and as more and more songs were written, getting more and more sophisticated and more and more layered, uh, at one point, Noam kind of challenged me, which has been kind of our dynamic, him like taking a, something I'd written and then challenging me to like, how can it be sharpened? How can it be deepened? Um, he challenged me like, what can we add to Rice Queens to bring it to the level of the other songs? Because the other songs are now a lot more complex. Uh, and I think that's the version which you saw in 2021. Um, one experience so the, the one side of the of the experience is like people think oh you're so quaint you're asian or you're so you're so like appealing um the other side of it uh is people putting you in a box mm -hmm. people, uh people um what do you call it uh projecting stereotyping. Yeah. Yeah. stereotyping you projecting their expectations of what it means to be asian specifically filipino onto you um 
And that's what I've written into the song. It has now been a whole comment. It now has become a whole commentary on beautiful fetishization, exoticization. Uh, people saying that because you're Filipino, you have to be a certain way. Otherwise, um, and if you're not that way, then you're less Filipino. Um, mm, mm, mm. So that is what it has become. And it has gone, even if it's told within the frame of this delicious flaming cabaret number <laughs> and oh my gosh I, I'm just so excited for you to see the way it's staged now um oh I can't wait to see it <laughs> yeah yeah it's so exciting but it it now has this like is it a spoiler it's not a spoiler uh this this just undercurrent of like yeah this this uncomfortable commentary yeah and I, I guess people have People have to see it. People, <laughs> people have to see it, and people have to see it. this number specifically. Oh my god! Another number that I really love, which is one of the newer numbers in the show, is called "Crazy," and it's about a uh, a couple that is applying, you know, for basically what is the the story of it? Um, it's a uh, it's a couple. Mm -hmm. um, they're two guys. Uh, they're married, and one of them is first-gen Filipino-American, and one of them is an immigrant. So they are at their... Oh, no, I'm getting emotional. Um, they are at their interview for their citizenship petition. So the guy who's a first-gen has petitioned the guy uh, who's an immigrant um, so that he can get his citizenship. And it comes from my own experience with my husband uh, when... Uh, shortly after we got married, we went in for a citizenship petition interview. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the idea is that in 10 minutes, this guy who who has never met us is going to assess like, is this an who actual is yeah. this an actual marriage or is this like a scam because this other guy wants his citizenship? And my husband and I had gone there with like a suitcase full of paraphernalia. Uh, we had <laughs> this is from when we met. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. It's exactly Here's the that. first test. I had to write a letter. <laughs> Noam had to. I asked Are you Noam, serious? Oh my goodness! I, I asked Noam and a bunch of other close friends to write affidavits certifying yes, this couple is a legit couple. They actually like each other. They actually love each other. They're actually married. They're actually married. Um, so yeah, so that number, that number crazy, which was written what? three weeks before we started rehearsal. Mm. Um, it, it explores like that crazy dynamic of a stranger from immigrant from from uh, Department of Homeland Security mm -hmm. evaluating a marriage yeah. based on a few documents in a 10 minute interview. But it also goes deeper and looks at the dynamics of marriage about the sacrifices we make, the changes. <laughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get emotional. But the sacrifices we make for each other, the changes we make for each yeah. other when we choose to get married or when, because of love. And when we're talking about representation, again, like I was I was so struck by Light of the Home because this was a story that I hadn't seen mm. before. To see um, this kind of contemporary queer couple thinking about what it means to be married, to have kids, to operate within a system that they might not actually agree with, but they live in at this time and how they subvert it or not, um, is another kind of story that I, I don't think we're, we've seen in the past as much on stage and kind of um, in this in this joyful, moving way. Yeah. And, and of course, more writers are doing that now, which is just so exciting to, to be a part of that wave. Um, and I'm really grateful that you added that song. I think it, it's an element that was missing from the show. It it was. I'm 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 really excited about that song. Um, we had, yeah, we were operating within within these parameters because in the way we've been structuring the show, we're like, okay, we need a duet between the tenor, one of the tenors and the baritoner. We need it to be funny and up tempo, but we also. I wanted it to be queer. Yeah. So working within those parameters, like what can we create? And it took a, a few drafts, more than a few drafts, <laughs> <laughs> more than a few drafts. But it, it's just, it's now become like one of my favorite numbers from the show. And yeah, I'm very excited about it. Yeah, that, that's so exciting. I think what's, especially right now with um, uh, the continued, um, haranguing of our queer community mm -hmm. um, 
politically speaking, it's it's so important to see these stories that are just like everybody else's, right? Normalizing a story of of someone who wants to get married and mm-hmm. be part of this country. Yeah. Um, let, you know, I, I I know some of the cast members. I've worked with some of the cast members. How has it been? I mean, I was there for the first read through and you knew that you know tears will flow and <laughs> laughter will flow it is a filipino musical so tears and laughter will go hand in hand the, the how has it been there yeah <laughs> the uh how has it been with a cast uh they're just fantastic i i mean let's go back to callbacks yeah. or even auditions um the amount of submissions that came in and the community that very quickly came together over two days of callbacks, which is just amazing. Um, the supportiveness and the excitement we had, um, apart from the music callbacks, we also had dance callbacks. And we also had a callback just for improv and group chemistry and just like harmony. And yeah, um, how supportive they were, how excited they were to be in the room together. We, They were taking selfies as a group and like we told them, please don't post those, uh, but they posted Too them late. anyway. <laughs> right. no, so that, that was, and there was just so much talent in the room. And you said, Noam, uh, really any combination of the people in that callback would have mm. for the show. And it just, it, it was a very hard decision. Um, I, I always... It's it's hard coming out of auditions and callbacks, just choosing a cast because you you want to cast so many people and so many people can do it, but the fact is there's only six slots, mm-hmm. so everything had to be factored in. Yeah, but but it was really wonderful to have actors then say, "Can we put some of these audition songs in our book because we want to go and audition with this mm. material?" Uh, of the six, one of the actors said that they've been in this industry for 14 years and they've never ever, ever had the opportunity to play Filipino character before, uh, and also a Filipino character who is queer and who is dealing with issues or questions that so closely aligns with their lived experience. And that, I think, across the board for the actors has been the most meaningful yeah. part of this rehearsal process. Another actress uh, has stepped away from theater. She was away from theater for 15 years uh, after having a very successful career, and this is her return, and and she said she wouldn't rather do it in any other way because she gets to bring her full self to this material. Yeah, another another member, not an not an actor, but another member of the creative team has said that he's been in a thousand performances of Miss Saigon, um, and yeah, he's just really happy that now he gets to to shape a musical that has characters who he can actually identify with, who he resonates with in a full fleshed out way. So it, it's, it's, been, it's been amazing. They are so talented. Um, they are so much fun to watch. Yeah, and they're having so much fun. They're having so much fun. Uh, yeah, that's so important. Yeah, I, I think it's so, it's so important to, to know that uh, there are many Filipino, Filipino American artists in the country, and not to diminish any of the roles that were we are given. Um, at a certain point, how many roles, how many non-Filipino roles are you okay to play? Right? I mean, talking about Miss Saigon um, uh, and the other plays or musicals that's been out there, um, but also when when. Uh, a musical like yours comes around and you just, the words just fall out of your mouth as if it was inside of you all along. I think that's really so beautiful. And I think what your team has done is lovingly, compassionately um, created this musical that's deep from the heart, Mm. you know? Um, for for Paulo from your lived experience, for Noam for being second generation and knowing what it's like for like just to be able to see like oh that's what my mom went through, you know I think that's so beautiful. Absolutely, um, the amount of heart that comes out in rehearsals has just been astounding. Um, 
One so <laughs> real quick, do you know you know what we're doing for Filipino night tomorrow? What we're giving them? <laughs> we're, we're giving I, I love them it. Papers like <laughs> portable, like like heavy tissue papers. Little tissues, little tissues. Marcy s- sent me the 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 photo, and I said, "Can That's I post so this?" Funny. Yeah, it should be the show merch. It's the merch. The Kleenex <laughs> is the merch. And a no. fan. Yeah. And a fan. <laughs> Yeah. No, it, it's been audiences come to the theater, they hear the words, they uh they hear the words in the music, they see the design, they see the dancing, they see the performances. One, I mean, you know this as a director yourself. Um one of the ingredients that people don't realize is so important and that because they don't see it on stage, not not like not like as uh clearly as you would see all those other elements what you don't see on stage is the conversations that happen mm-hmm. uh, behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. The table work, as it's called. Um, yeah. And just for me, I, 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 I sat in on pretty much all the table work that Noam led with the actors. Um, and just the conversations Noam led with them and the way the actors would just mm. would um, talk about these songs and and, and like... I enjoy being surprised uh, as a writer. I enjoy it when I write something and then I realize, oh, I didn't even intend that that's, mm-hmm. that that line could be read that way, that yeah. that character could be mm. having this other like aspect of their psyche. Um, and it's just thrilling when, it's thrilling on two levels. It's thrilling on the level of how personal it becomes for the actors but it's thrilling on the level of how creative the actors get. Like, oh, I'll approach it this way. Um, and I, it's just so thrilling and such an honor to be let in. And mm. it, it really comes to a point when I feel that this is really now a, a creation of a community. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's beautiful. So the heart, and I, I, I think that the heart does come out on stage. Yeah. yeah. I also think that the whole cast is really excited, not just about the show, but about this moment in theater uh, where there are so many amazing new AAPI created plays and musicals. We had a video series where we shot just congratulations messages to all of the different <laughs> musicals and plays that are opening and closing by AAPI the writers. Coleman and, and South yeah. Coast Rep. Yeah. Coleman. Uh, and yeah. And, and, and I think we, we shot like, eight or nine of these videos. And so to be a part of this moment that is bigger than this show too, and is a national moment, uh, I think just energizes people because they feel like they're part of something really special um, in in the way that theater is um, really reflecting the audiences who should be coming to see theater, who have always been coming to see theater and the artists who have been working in the theater and haven't necessarily had been centered in that kind of way. Yeah. Uh, and so, so that is just energizing for everyone. Mm-hmm. It's exciting yeah. like, all, all around the country. I mean, from Here Lies Love opening soon on Broadway to uh, this, to musicals going up in uh, Larry, the musical going up in San Francisco, Lizard Boy uh, by Pinoy composer, Seattle-based Pinoy composer, Justin Huertas opening off Broadway. And your work, Gio, mm-hmm. is, uh bay area oh yeah yeah we're going to be lost too yeah congratulations yeah. from the reading it's, yeah so it's it's a moment it's a it's a very exciting moment to be part of i think it's it's so important uh to say that we are like i'll go back we're not a monolith right we have we are so varied even within our culture there's so many varied um segues to our stories and that's what what your piece clearly does there's so many shows right now it's very exciting mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. we'll wrap up in just one second uh but i do want to do a shout out to the city of west hollywood for for allowing us to come together and offering us this this gathering so mm-hmm. big shout out to our folks in we yes, we thank you, wanna WeHo. make sure y'all come it goes on until June 4th. And um, also, obviously, East West Players and Film Arts Teatro. Um, what's next? That's the last question. What's next for both of you? Uh, what's next? Well, for this show, for On the Side of the World, uh, we 
we open soon and um, we're very excited uh, at how tickets have been selling. Um, like I said, we've been wanting to bring this show to the Pinoy communities and even the non-Pinoy communities in LA yeah. just because of how, yeah. because I mean, Pinoy culture is just so prevalent here and pervasive. So I think even if you're not Pinoy, you're going to appreciate the show. Oh, you're absolutely. Gonna you're going to enjoy the yeah. show. Uh, we would like to go to other cities around the U.S. Um, we would we would love to go up and down the West Coast uh, where there are so many uh, huge Pinoy and AAPI and immigrant populations make our way uh, across the country, uh, other cities with large Pinoy populations, and eventually back to New York. Um, so that's on the on the side of the world front. Uh, and then we have we're working on a new project uh, as part of our development for on the side of the world. We had an opportunity to meet Jose Antonio Vargas, uh, who is uh, as you as you might know a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist mm -hmm. uh, and immigrant rights activist, um, Filipino American and uh, is uh, really outspoken in terms of redefining what it means to be an American and changing mm. how immigrant narratives are expressed through different forms of media. Uh, and he's been a big supporter of On the Side of the World when we met him through uh, G. Uh, we had an opportunity to, um, to talk with him about the songs, which uh, he binge watched one, <laughs> one night with Giselle. And Giselle told him, let's just watch all these videos. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so uh, in in preparing to meet with with Jose, we read uh, his very powerful memoir about being undocumented in the United States called Dear America. America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we both turned to each other and we we thought this would make an incredible musical because of Jose's journey, um, both uh, trying to assimilate to the United States and then realizing that he stands apart because he was undocumented, mm -hmm. then spending fifteen years hiding while reaching the peak of journalism only to finally reveal that he was undocumented in the New York Times and in Time Magazine, and now becoming a major activist mm -hmm. uh, across the country. And so we we asked Jose if he'd be willing to let us develop the show, and he said yes, which That's is so exciting. amazing. So, Super exciting. so uh, exciting. we fly back to New York, and in June, we begin rehearsals for um, very early workshop uh, of uh, dear America. Yeah. Oh my gosh. No rest. No rest. <laughs> no rest. No rest for the storytellers. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much, Paulo and Noam. We are so excited to uh, present on this side of the world at East West Players. Um, uh, we have, there's previews tonight. There's a Filipino night with Philem Arts tomorrow. Opening so excited is. for that. So excited. Yeah. On Sunday, and it goes until June 4th. So big shout out to City of West Hollywood once again. And for, for everyone involved in this musical, the creative team and the amazing cast. Yay, thanks. I thanks. think uh, we want to leave the audience off with a, with a snippet, with a little snippet from On the Side of the World. That's right, that's right. The second song I wrote, uh, which I wrote shortly after I met my husband-to-be. <laughs> What's the title of the song? The title of the song is "The Language Lesson." Um, yes, yes. So, so in 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 Tagalog, there's this word "kilig," K I L I G, which is kind of a favorite conversation piece that Pinoys have with non-Pinoys because it's like it's an untranslatable Tagalog word. Um, kilig or gigil, right? Kilig, kilig or gigil. Is... I I I. I I had a whole list of like untranslatable Tagalog words. Oh, can um, you send it to me? I'd love to know. Kilig, <laughs> gigil, sabik. Uh, sabik is another. Oh one. my god, sabik! Oh I my god, words. it's so, it's like saudaji in Portuguese. You know, it's just, oh, oh a love beautiful it. word. And then yeah, oh. so I had a whole list. Um, and the language lesson was originally about those three words: sabik, gigil, and uh, kilig. But it turned out to be like too long, <laughs> so so I cut it down to kilig, and I wrote it for my husband because he made Aww. me kilig. Uh, so yeah, that's the song. We'll leave we'll leave the audience off with the language lesson sang by Zandi, sung sung by Zandi de Jesus from our cast. Someone you like is nearby And that ticklish tingling trembling begins When they look you in the eye And the butterflies in 
Your heart is a thousand times bigger than a smile could ever 